Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to rise in the House today to speak to Bill C-29. Uh, I've been listening to all the debate that's been taking place, and I note that we, as members of Parliament, seem to be debating uh, lots of different things all at once, and not necessarily always Bill C-29. So, especially on a day such as today, where we're eagerly awaiting the Minister of Finance's update. Today, we are waiting for the fiscal update, the economic update by the Minister of Finance on the state of public finances. So, I am pleased to have the opportunity to make a speech right now in this debate, but I will be attending the lockup for the fiscal update. In a minute now, we'll be getting additional financial information from the Minister of Finance, and some of the media reports that have foreshadowed what we may see in that report have become part of this debate as if they're in C-29. Well, they're not, so we, we don't know much about what will be proposed. Uh, there are concerns, as many colleagues have raised, about what might be proposed around infrastructure, what might be proposed around specifics of an infrastructure bank. It's not in C-29. We know that we're also talking today about the budget document itself, and much of what's in the budget document is not in C-29. So let me just clarify for, for parliamentarians and those who may be watching us today, across Canada, what is this Bill C-29? First of all, uh, and uh, I try to be as fair as possible in all circumstances, and I railed against the omnibus budget bills of the previous government, such as the spring omnibus budget bill of 2012, Bill C-38, that changed more than 70 different laws and regulations that abolished important institutions of public policy, such as the uh, National Roundtable on Environment and Economy. It did many things that were never referenced in the budget. It extended itself well beyond what a budget should usually do, and this was the spring uh, omnibus bill of, of 2012. The fall omnibus bill uh, was C-45 of 2012, and it, it uh, uh, completely gutted the Navigable Waters Protection Act while the spring omnibus bill gutted the Fisheries Act and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. I reflect on that just to say that there's different kinds of omnibus bills. There's illegitimate omnibus bills, and there are bills that take into account many different measures, but all flow from a budget. This is in the category of legitimate omnibus bill. There's nothing in here that isn't required by what was in the budget document that we received last spring. Last spring's budget set out changes, particularly to the child, uh, Canada Child Benefit. It set out changes to various aspects of the Income Tax Act. So if, if Canadians were to pick up B Bill C-29 and read it, they'd find uh, little that would be, I, as a matter of fact, I don't think, I think I'm not making too much of a stretch to say nothing that would be alarming. Uh, there are provisions to begin to understand how we measure carbon emissions in terms of emissions allowances, how taxpayers account for that, how Revenue Canada uh, and the Department of Finance will account for that. So this is what I would describe as, I mean, there's certainly new rules for charities, extensions uh, for what kinds of donations can be considered ca charitable donations. Uh, there are provisions that are purely to do with the tax code, as one would hope, when you're looking at a budget bill. So it's not an illegitimate budget bill, but it does, of course, allow us to turn our attention to, um, to the budget and, and to reflect on what was there and what wasn't there in relation to uh, the um, promises made in last year's campaign. We are just about at the one-year mark for this new administration, and I think it's fair to reflect at the one-year mark in relation to budget matters only today, so I will stay within the frame of budgetary matters in my presentation. But I have to say, in order to, to provide commentary on Bill C-29 itself, uh, there's very little there. Now, I want to be honest with Canadians. Uh, there's nothing here that, that gets me worried or upset, except for what's missing. And I want to be clear about that. What's missing is that the Liberal platform last year committed to getting rid of subsidies to fossil fuels. There were really only two bullet points under 
the uh, liberal platform commitment to climate action? Well, I'd say three. One was they would attend at Paris and negotiate. They did that, and they did it superbly. Two was that they would be put in place a national carbon price. That's a work in progress, but we've seen um, some progress. I have to say I bemoan the fact that the starting price is at $10 a ton, but the architecture of it is fair and will only top up those provinces that have failed themselves to decide how they want to price their emissions. But this missing piece really deserves much more attention. The commitment was clear that subsidies to fossil fuels would come to an end. Now, the, the 2016 budget, back at page 221, commits until the end of when it uh, the end of uh, the period that the previous government had already committed subsidies for a new class of subsidy brought in in 2015 for liquefied natural gas. Now, some may say, well, LNG, natural gas, is a fairly clean burning fossil fuel. But when it comes from fracked gas, which the LNG industry in British Columbia is projected to come from fracked gas, it has the same carbon footprint as coal. So seeing a provision here that continues into the well into the future, that's a concern. And that should come to an end much, much sooner. We also were promised a lot of spending in infrastructure. But when you look at the actual budget figures, only one-tenth of what's promised in infrastructure will occur before the next election. So again, when you want to stimulate the economy, and I really am keen to hear what our finance minister is about to announce later today, but if you're trying to stimulate the economy through investments in infrastructure, then you really have to make those investments in infrastructure. You have to do them sooner than later. So having only one-tenth of the money flowing to things like uh, public transit, which we urgently need. We urgently need, and there is a reference in the budget of a very small amount of money over a two-year period, for examining what we need in terms of improving Canada's east-west electricity grid. We need that relatively, I have to say, not relatively, we need that urgently. We are a very big country, and we tend to have far too many interprovincial barriers. Interprovincial barriers to trade, we're familiar with talking about. We don't think so much about the interprovincial barriers to electricity. Why is it that we have provinces struggling to go off coal and having trouble buying renewable energy from the province next door? We really do need to invest in what is a real nation building project, which will create jobs and which also will provide uh, the fastest route to decarbonizing our electricity grid is to improve access across provincial boundaries. We look at the absurdity right now that uh, Newfoundland is struggling to build what it's the CEO of the company building it. Nalcor is building Muskrat Falls, and the CEO, Stan Marshall, has already referred to, to Muskrat Falls as a boondoggle that should never have been built. They'll be coming cap in hand to the federal treasury to look for money to bail out that project, but I think they'll find that uh, it's throwing good money after bad. You could get, and of course Nova Scotia is saying we can't shut down coal till we get an underwater cable all the way from Muskrat Falls. Now, Hydro-Quebec is sitting there, right next to the Atlantic provinces. And Hydro-Quebec's electricity could get exactly as far as Moncton. You could turn a switch, you could open up your electricity grid, you could work out the financing. Part of it may be that Manitoba Hydro prefers to sell south to the United States and Hydro-Quebec prefers to sell south to the United States because it, the sales to the U.S. don't affect their equalization payments. Ah. So if we start thinking like a country, we might want to figure out how do we maximize the benefit from electricity generated in one province and be able to ease its access to another. Going off fossil fuels as quickly as possible should be a national goal, while at the same time ensuring that the fossil fuels we use in Canada are the ones manufactured and refined in Canada. I think we have the beginnings of a made in Canada solution for our energy, for our workers, for the Alberta economy, if we were willing to invest in refineries instead of pipelines and take away the subsidies to fossil fuels as was promised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.